I want to welcome everyone to our Lunch and Learn with the North Alabama Agriplex and the Cooperative Extension. We will get started in just a few minutes. We are live on Facebook as well. Okay, so just a few more minutes and then we will get started. We are recording today's class if you want to go back and watch again later. And right now we should have everybody's microphones muted. Um, make sure that you find the chat box if you have questions today, if you will enter in the chat box. And at the end of the program today, we'll have an opportunity for a door prize. We actually have a giveaway of a $20 gift card to Chambers um, store. So if you need to go get you some new pruning shears or some plants, they will be available there. And that will be happening at the end of our class today. So we'll, we'll just wait a couple more minutes. And I think if your microphone is not muted, if you'll make sure that you are muted. Okay, chat box. Tony, I keep muting you, but I'll unmute you again. <laughs> okay, right now we have 28 people live with us on Zoom. And we are also live on Facebook today. And we are admitting people. Wait just a couple more minutes and then we'll get started. So if you have questions today, please enter those in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. I want to welcome you to the Lunch and Learn with the North Alabama Agriplex today. This is our second Lunch and Learn for the year. The first one we have virtually with seed starting. Um, all of our virtual programs we are putting on the North Alabama Agriplex YouTube channel. So if you just go to YouTube and search North Alabama Agriplex, um, this video will be recorded there, as well as our recent um, seed starting program, our raised bed gardening program are on there. We have hydroponics um, and several others. So please check out the North Alabama Agriplex YouTube page. Um, we will be having next month's Lunch and Learn will also be Zoom and that will be pruning ornamentals. Today is pruning fruit trees, pruning ornamentals is coming next. Our Lunch and Learn series is one that is free. You don't have to sign up for, you don't have to register. You just show up for those programs. And in April, we will plan to be back in person with our Alabama Rivers a Celebration and Challenge, which is an author lecture with Dr. Bill Deutsch from Auburn, who is one of the founders of the Alabama Water Watch. I'm really excited about this program. I think it'll be really good. Dr. Deutsch was actually there for one of, um, for the first Earth Day celebrations. And he um, spoke when I was a student at Auburn at the, I tried to figure it out. I think it was like the 31st Earth Day. So now we're like on the 50 something Earth Day. So this will be our Earth Day celebration on April the 21st at the Agriplex. And we will do that lunch and learn um, virtually as well so that you'll get the chance to watch that if you're not able to come in person. And that's what we'll continue to do with our Lunch and Learns for now. Um, if anybody's interested, we're looking for a corporate sponsor for our Lunch and Learn series still. So you can contact us at the North Alabama Agriplex if anybody knows a corporate sponsor that would like to sponsor these classes today. So we have just put out our books, our Agriplex 2021 program brochures, and they have all of our classes in them for the year. 
Um, our registration for the spring programs are up on our agriplex.org website. If you go to programs, all those are up there, as well as a PDF copy of our brochure. Um, if you want to get a brochure, we have them at the Agriplex, stop by with them on the porch or have those in person. If you're a business that wants to have um, some of our brochures to put out, please let us know. We're trying to spread the word because we usually get them out a little bit before March. Um, and please check out our virtual resources. I told everybody earlier, these classes will be on the North Alabama Agriplex YouTube page. And so you can just search North Alabama Agriplex and today's recording will be up there also. So we're super excited to have Tony Glover with us. Um, the Extension has partnered on this Lunch and Learn series and Tony knows so many things about so many different things, horticulture related, plant related, and is an expert on pruning. So if you are like me and you have some small fruits in your backyard, but don't know how to maintain them properly, this is the class for you today. So please um, continue to ask uh, questions in the chat box at the bottom if you have questions, and then we will take more questions at the end of the program. We will also do a drawing for a $20 chamber gift card for those on Zoom. So I'm sorry guys on Facebook, that won't be an option, but if you're on Zoom with us, um, we will have a drawing at the end. And Tony, it's 12.02, so I think we're ready to get started. So thank you all for being with us today. Okay, can you hear me okay? You see in my first slide? Yes. All right. Well, I'm glad to be with you today. Uh, I'm a short timer, as they say, and, and uh, my business, I'll only be uh, performing this duty for about another month and a half and be retiring, but uh, Rachel might invite me back occasionally to come and speak <laughs> even after I retire. Uh, and if she, do, if she does, I'll get to talk to you again. Uh, but looking forward to our visit today on home fruit pruning. Um, we're not going to talk about the whole production scheme, but I will mention just some general comments uh, about fruit production uh, kind of to get us started, but then we're gonna focus in primarily on pruning issues related to fruit culture. One of the things I encourage people to do, uh, we were talking about it just before we came on with Rachel about her husband going to the store and coming home with three apple trees. And I said, that's exactly what I tell people do not do because you might buy things you don't want in terms of the size of the plant, uh, and whether or not it's adapted, uh, impulse buying can, can sometimes uh, lead you to make a really a bad choice that when you're producing fruit, it takes several years usually to get in full production. And if you choose a bad cultivar or one that's very difficult to train or prune properly because of its size, when we talk about particularly something like apple trees that, that Rachel was talking about, um, then that mistake that you make early on, you won't really realize it until literally years later. And same holds true if you choose a poor variety, you may not realize it. I get calls every year where people have, have bought um, different types of grapes that aren't adapted to our area or blueberries that aren't adapted and certainly apples and peaches that just aren't adapted to our area. So I encourage you, if you're just getting into fruit production, really spend some time researching, contact the extension office and find out what are the best cultivars of whatever fruit you're gonna try to grow. Uh, and, and let us kind of help you with that decision so you'll make a good decision up front. So that's you know certainly something I would encourage everybody to do right out of the gate. But oftentimes we find people have already planted and they're now they're at the stage where they're trying to figure out how to train properly these plants. Sometimes people don't think about it until uh, a few years after they plant and then they think, well, how do I train this plant? Some things you can correct fairly simply. We'll talk about some of those. Some things, if you don't train them from the get-go properly, it's hard to retrain them. It's hard to get them back into shape. Um, I had a few questions that were sent to me prior to the presentation today, and some of them were along the lines of, what if I have a big overgrown pear tree or apple tree and I'm trying to get it back in 
to shape. We'll hit on that just a little bit, but uh, let me just mention up front that it's much easier to train a tree than it is to retrain a tree. I often equate it to raising children. I've had experience with that, raising five children, and it's much easier to train them as they grow than it is to try to retrain them after they're grown. Uh, <laughs> hopefully that you can relate to that, that if you have children of your own or, or grandchildren. Uh, and, and same holds true for trees and other fruit as well. But some things are a little easier to correct than others. And we'll talk about some of those. But it helps to have the proper tools when we're starting to train trees. Uh, I like to have a good pair of bypass loppers that's on both the left and right, just uh, different types of handles, wood versus a metal type handle. And bypass simply means that uh, when you make the cut, the sharp blade bypasses the other portion of the um, lopper so that it makes a clean cut. Um, the other type that you might see sold is like the hand loppers on the, on the uh, right here next to the top big loppers. That's an anvil type pruning device. And it basically has a sharp blade that pinches down onto a flat blade. And those are much, they're really better for cutting flowers or herbaceous plants, things like that. They're not that good for woody plants. So you wanna make sure that you get both a bypass lopper and a bypass hand pruner that we see on the left-hand side. Can you see my mouse moving across it, Rachel? Is that showing up? Okay, so that's the bypass type. This is the anvil type on this side. And then it's always good to have a, a small handsaw. And one like this with a curved blade is ideal for pruning uh, fruit plants, particularly small fruit trees, like peaches and apples and pears and things like that. When you get into bigger trees, you can actually use chainsaws as well to do some really corrective type pruning. But these would be the things you need to do training in the early years of the tree in particular. And if you train properly, you'll probably never need to use anything other than these tools that you see right here. Okay, so let's talk about some specific fruit. Uh, I'm gonna talk about grapes, uh, but particularly muscadine grapes. Uh, that's the ones that we can really grow best here. We can grow bunch grapes, and there are, there are even some wine grapes that are, are starting to, to be available that have been developed out in California that we can grow here, um, but they're much more difficult to grow. And for a beginner, uh, muscadine grapes are native fruit. They don't have very many pest problems if they're pruned and trained properly you seldom will have to do anything to them other than prune them and fertilize them. Uh, we very seldom have enough pest pressure that you would need to, to worry about using any kind of pesticides. So that's a big plus for a homeowner. Uh, I always encourage people if they're new to fruit growing that they start with some of the easier things in terms of uh, maintenance and muscadines are, would be in that group uh, they do require some training the first few years, but after that, pretty easy to maintain uh, and don't require a lot of pesticides for sure. So let's talk about those just a little bit. Uh oh, okay. This is what happens if you don't train them and if you don't prune them. Uh, if you just kind of let them grow, they're extremely vigorous. Uh, if you take any walk in the edge of a woods, you'll see muscadine sometimes growing to the top of a tree. They're very vigorous. They can grow several feet a year, almost at the level of something like kudzu in terms of their potential for growth. So very, very vigorous plants. And what happens if you don't train them and prune them regularly is you'll see this sort of scenario develop and look how many fruit are in there, but they're all very, very small. So if you don't train them and cut them back regularly and get them to uh, a manageable amount of vine growth each year, you'll have lots and lots of fruit, 
but they'll be very small and very poor quality and mostly skin and seed and not very much of what you really want uh, the good part of the, the grape. So that's the why part of it. So if you go out there and look, you may see occasionally in the winter time, this kind of tangled mess uh, of vines and wonder and be scratching your head like the gentleman's doing here. Where do I start pruning something like that? And you might think this is a, just a neglected vine. Probably not. This might have been neglected for a year, uh, but no more than two years. That's how much growth you can get on a muscadine if it's healthy, even in one season, but you have to cut it back severely to get it to a manageable condition again. So what should it look like? This is what it should look like after pruning in the early spring. Now we like to prune in the winter and now is a good time. You can prune from now or really, really any time from January to March is a good window. And that's true pretty much for all your dormant season pruning on all the fruit that we're gonna talk about. We do some summer pruning, mostly for training purposes or to take a plant that's overly vigorous and deinvigorate it. In other words, to make it grow, slow down its growth rate. And I'll talk a little bit about that when we get to some of the other crops, but <coughs> excuse me, in general, <clears throat> with muscadines, we use what we call cordon training. And that's simply the, the branch. You have a trunk, you, you train it up to a wire, and then you go both left and right down the wire. And that branch that's going left and right off the main trunk is called a cordon. Uh, it's simply a long individual branch uh, is the picture. And then, off of those individual cordons, you'll have shoots that come off all down the length of that branch. And that's where the new growth will occur and produce the fruit. So to give you an idea of what's going on, we'll go a little bit further so you can see it in the dormant season. <clears throat> Look at this illustration here. And on the left-hand side, this is kind of that tangled mess. Sometimes it's even far worse than this, where you've got last year's growth that can sometimes reach as far as from the wire to the ground. Uh, so they, they can grow several feet in one year. And then over on the right hand side of this cordon, sometimes they're just called arms. As you see here, the arms of the cordon. Then all of that last year's growth has been cut back to where you see the arrows pointing. These are called spurs. They're spurs off of the cordon. And these little spurs will, um, if you look back and see here, we can see, okay, there's, la there's a one year's growth and there's another year's growth. So that's about a three year old spur, one, two, three. Well, the spurs will eventually get really large and you'll have to thin them out, take some of them out. You'd like to have a spur cluster about every six to no more than 12 inches apart, but no closer than six inches apart down the wire. If we've got spurs that are pointed straight down, as you see here, where my arrow's pointing, those would be candidates to remove out completely. We like for the spurs to be coming off either pointing somewhat upright or laterally out from the cordon at about, uh, at, at about uh, even with the cordon height. So if they're pointing down, that's kind of a weak spur and we'd like to get rid of that. So as you thin them out, keep that in mind. And we've cut back last year's growth to about three buds. So this little bit of a stub that we've left on our spur, we've got one here and one here and one on the end. Each one of those would have about three buds. So just count the bud length, 
usually that means they'll end up being about four inches or so long to have three buds on them. And that's enough. So you just go all the way down the length. And usually these are 10 feet in each direction. So muscadines are planted 20 feet apart. So this cordon is 10 feet, this cordon is 10 feet, and then it'll meet up with another one if you've got a long enough row. And so you have 20 feet of vine, 20 feet of cordon uh, on each plant. Each one of those 10 foot cordons will have about 15 to 20 of these spurs. If you see more than that, thin out the ones that are too close together or the ones that are poorly positioned like these that are kind of hanging down. And here's a close up where you can kind of see what that actually looks like. So you'll think when you get through, oh, I've killed it. There's just nothing left. How in the world can it even produce? Well, grapes produce on the new growth. And so there's plenty of buds left to have enough new growth to make a full crop. And as a matter of fact, if you leave too much, you start getting much, much smaller berries. So this is what those spurs start to look like after six or seven years. So you can see they get kind of tangled up and old looking. So it's important to thin out the spur thinning as needed occasionally. So you wanna get it down to maybe, they say 2.5 spurs per foot here. I usually figure on about two per foot. That's about six inches apart. That's enough, I think. It's easier to maintain them. So about two spurs every foot is probably good enough. But certainly no more than 25 on one of those 10 foot cordons, but 20 is probably a better number to shoot for. Okay, any questions about muscadines? Because I've got several things to cover in our short time, so I'm gonna get there. Uh, if you've got a question just specifically about muscadines, put it in the chat, let me know. Uh, we'll talk about peaches and apples and other things later. I see some of that in the chat as well. <coughs> okay, so let's jump on to, um, let me back up for just a second on on muscadines and mention one other thing. I get this question every year, so I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and mention it to try to allay any fears that you might have. Um, the, the, the cuts that you make after we've had a good bit of rain will oftentimes weep. People say, well, they're bleeding. Lots of liquid is dripping out. Don't worry about that. That's not an issue, it doesn't hurt the plant, and they may drip for several days after you make those cuts. Uh, but don't let that worry you. It's still important to get your pruning done, even if you run it a little bit late and don't get it until March, where they tend to drip a little bit worse as we get closer to spring because the sap is kind of moving through the plant quickly. It's rising in the plant. Uh, I did get a question in the chat about bunching grapes. Now you don't prune bunch grapes the same way. What you do with bunch grapes is you actually uh, renew the cordons every year. And so you're much closer together. You only plant about 10 feet apart. And instead of having a permanent cordon or arm going in each direction, you have new shoots coming off the main trunk, high up on the main trunk that replace the arm, the total arm is replaced every year with a new arm. They grow vigorously enough to do this if you fertilize them properly. It only has to go five feet in each direction because the plants are twice as close, 10 feet apart. So you put a new arm up every spring and you cut the old one off back to the main trunk. You'll leave a little spur so that you can get more new arms for the next year. And there'll be more arms than you need or more cordons than you need. So only pick the two best ones, one going in left and one going right and find a nice four or five foot long one. And then just cut the old one off the wire totally, put the new one up on the wire. Uh, so that's, that's how we prune bunch grapes. It's pretty simple, but you're pruning back to nearly nothing every year. 
Okay, so we're going to talk about blackberries. You'll see that in the chat. <laughs> blackberries. What are they? This is a confusing issue for a lot of people. Uh, are they um, annuals, biennials, or perennials? Uh, in some ways, they're all three. Um, they produce their fruit uh, on an annual cane. Uh, in other words, it, it, it will produce one year and die the next. Uh, but they're actually, in some ways, a biennial in that they'll always be fruiting canes and vegetative canes without fruit out there at the same time, particularly toward the middle part of the growing season. You'll see your canes with fruit on it. Those canes are called flora canes because they have flowers on them and fruit on them. And then you'll see these vigorous green shoots that are coming up amongst the other canes that are highly vegetative, but there's no flowers forming on them yet. Those are vegetative or primocanes. They're called primocanes, primary canes. They produce vegetation the first year and then they overwinter and the next year they become the flora canes. And then you'll remove the old spent last year's flora canes out. So we'll talk about that in the pruning process. So it can be a little bit confusing for people because of the way that, that uh, blackberries grow. So in another sense, they are perennial in that they live many, many years, but they're replacing their canes on an annual basis. So as I mentioned, you've got these two different types of canes growing at the same time. You've got the primocane, the vegetative first year, year shoot, and then those flowering canes. So here's how we prune. In the summertime, we do what we call summer topping. We cut and remove approximately six inches off the tip of those vigorous primocanes when they get about four feet tall. If you've got them, you're gonna train them to a wire, which I highly suggest you train them to a wire. Um, the wire will be at about four feet high. When it gets up to that wire, cut the top out and then it will start to branch. And then you'll also do some dormant pruning. The dormant pruning is when you cut out the spent flora canes, in other words, the ones that had fruit on them the last year, and you cut them out all the way to the ground. You can actually do this, even though I say dormant pruning, some people wait and do it during the dormant season because it's not as hot getting out there and pruning, but you can actually cut these out and it would be beneficial to do it this way anytime after harvest. So after you've harvested your, your crop, then those spent canes, they can just be um, removed. And then also during the dormant time, these summer pruned primocanes will have branched and they'll send out several uh, long shoots called lateral branches. And in the winter time, you wanna shorten these up to about 12 inches to 18 inches in that range. So here's where we're topping in the summer. Once we've got it about four feet tall, we top it out. As you see here on the right, it's been topped. And then once you top it, here's been a couple weeks after it was topped, you've got six or eight shoots coming out. That's your lateral shoots that in the winter time you'll shorten up. And that's where your fruit will be next year. So here's kind of an illustration of that so you can see what it looks like. You'll remove out the spent canes and that would be these brown looking ones. That's the ones that had fruit on them. You can easily tell them apart, I promise you. You'll be able to tell the ones that had fruit on them. Uh, they're a different color. And also they will have the old spent pieces of the uh, uh, structure where the fruit was attached. And they'll be really ragged, poor looking uh, spent, vine, spent uh, vines. So the other ones will be healthier, different color. And that's the ones that you'll just shorten up. So here on the left is where you've come in and you've made these cuts at about a foot or 18 inches at the most and shortened them up. 
So that's what it should look like after you've done your dormant pruning. You, some, of, some types of blackberries are more trellising than others. So the ones that are the most running types, you might even wanna have a couple wires, one low and one high to put these on. If they're real erect upright, you might just cage them in with a wire on each side. And I'll show you a picture of that here in a second. This is a real trailing type that uh, is a real running type blackberry. And they've actually got three wires. I think this might've been at the experiment station before it closed. They had theirs on three wires because it was a real running type vine. So that's one option. And if you do have that, you can actually cut during the growing season, some of the canes that are coming up when they reach the first wire, you let some more come up and reach the second wire and some more come up all the way to the top wire, which could be as high as five or six feet. But most of the time you wouldn't have more than two wires. All right, here's another situation where they've actually got wires on both sides of this post, which is about an 18 inch arm here. And you've actually kind of caged the wire in between uh, an upper, a lower and an upper wire rather than training them right to the wire, you're actually just kind of caging them to hold them up. That's another option. Here's a picture of that same sort of setup during the winter months before the old floor canes have been removed. You see what I'm talking about on the color difference? These light colored brown, that's the old spent ones. They look dead. And in fact, they are dead. Uh, they're not going to do anything else the next year. If you left them, they'd just be dead, dead pieces. But you want to get them out of there because that reduces disease problems and it keeps it from getting crowded in here. And then these reddish colored, that's the ones that will make the crop the following spring. And these are the ones that you'll shorten these side shoots to 12 to 18 inches. So here it is after you remove the old floor canes and shortened up some of the side shoots. Okay. And you can use just a high tensile wire. Somebody asked about uh, what do you trellis them with? Uh, doesn't take a strong wire because it's not a lot of weight that will be put on it. So any kind of high tensile type wire is sufficient for that. And someone asked about raspberries. Raspberries should be treated like trailing blackberries. They have to be trellised up on a wire and tied to the wire uh, because they don't make a very erect plant. And raspberries don't grow as well here. There are very few varieties that really can perform in our heat. There's one called Dorman Red that's moderately good, but if you're used to good tasting raspberries, you won't be impressed with anything that we can grow here in the South. All right, well, let's look at uh, blueberries. I suggest that you start rabbit eyes as your main blueberry that you grow. It is the best adapted to our climate. Southern high bush can be grown here, but it um, needs really, really well-drained soil or it has to be grown in a container. And northern high bush is not adapted at all to our climate. And a lot of times I'll see at these big box stores, they'll be selling northern high bush that will not grow here. And that's why I say it's important to find out what you're buying. Uh, and you might not be able to tell that from the common name that they put on it, because they'll give them uh, nice sounding names and they, not, they won't tell you that it's a northern high bush. You have to look it up and see if it is. But rabbit eye are, are certainly good. And rabbit eye is not a variety. Rabbit eye is a species uh, of, of blueberries. There are many, many rabbit eye varieties. And you need to have at least two that bloom about the same time to get good production. Uh, Blueberries are not very self-fertile. They'll make a few fruit if you just had one plant, but they make a lot more if you have two plants that can cross-pollinate. And they have to be two rabbit eye types. In other words, if you're growing rabbit eyes, you wouldn't want a rabbit eye in a southern high bush. They may not 
they could give a little cross pollination, but they may not bloom at the same time. And that's critical. They have to bloom at the same time to be cross pollinated well. So very little pruning is required for blueberries the first several years, probably five, six years. You don't have to do a whole lot. Um, you can remove some of the real low hanging branches, dead or diseased wood, little twiggy growth that's too small to really produce very much. Um, and then, um, you know, any, anything that's broken, that sort of thing. But you don't do a whole lot until the plants get up four, five, six feet tall. And then you, then you need to start managing to hold the mature height to no more than six feet tall. And I'll talk about how to do that here in a second. So annually, after they're about that age, you remove one or two of the oldest canes to control height and to stimulate new sucker growth. And you remove those all the way back to near the base of the plant, near the ground. I'd say most years you're gonna to have to remove two. Sometimes you may have to remove three, but don't remove more than about 25 to 30% of the total number of shoots or canes that are coming up from the ground. Someone asked about how far apart can they be and still pollinate? Uh, probably you'd want them within 50 feet to really assure that you get pollination, but the closer they are, the better pollination will be, particularly if there's a lot of barriers between the two. You, the bees might not find, find the other one. And this is what I mean by removing the largest canes out. You're actually totally taking them out back to the ground annually after it's six or seven years old, you're gonna to have to start doing this. Maybe if it's real vigorous after the fifth year, but certainly after the sixth or seventh year. So we may have uh, half a dozen canyons there and we could remove no more than about two of those. That would be 33% of them if we had six, uh, but don't remove more than that. And the reason we remove the oldest canes or the largest canes is uh, we want to renew the canes so that we have basically a new plant every three or four years. You've got a totally new plant because you've cut out all the oldest canes every year. And the newer canes, the younger canes will be much more productive. You'll be able to keep them to the size you want and they'll produce much bigger berries because the vigorous shoots that, that are new will produce berries that are twice the size, sometimes more than that, of these old canes that get older than five or six years old. And we like to do it so that we thin out the center so that we allow some room for new growth to come into the center. Uh, so here, some of the old canes have been removed back to the ground. And this is what it looks like after pruning. Once you've done this, you'll think, oh no, I've just I've cut way too much. But I promise you, the ones that remain will make much bigger, better berries if you do this consistently. So on the left is pre-pruning, and on the right is the same plant after it's been pruned. It looks like half the growth has gone out of there, and it could be half the growth. You may have only removed a third of the canes, but it because they were older canes, it may be half of the growth has been removed out of there. But this is allowing for these remaining shoots to be much more vigorous, to get much more sunlight to them, and the berries will get a lot larger and they'll be easier to harvest. Here's a good planting in the spring after they've been properly pruned, where you see here you've got uh, two, three, four, five, about six canes. Six or eight canes is what you'd like to see maximum coming out of the ground. And don't let it produce more than that or maintain more than that. You may have noticed if you don't prune your blueberries, what happens is they get taller and taller and they start shading the rest of the plant out. All your fruit are out there on the ends of those real tall branches and they're very, very small. 
here's a well-maintained planting. Uh, looks like it's about five or six years old. And I say that to let you know that if you prune them properly, they'll always look like they're five or six years old because they actually are five or six years old because you've removed growth that's older than that out. Any, okay, here, let me look at my questions on the chat. Prune blueberries in the January, March timeframe, that is, yes, that is good timing. But I might also mention that you can do a little bit of, of uh, pruning in the summer months if you've got uh, overly vigorous shoots that have come up and they're getting too tall. You can actually tip some of those out and force branching so that you get some side branching. If you do it by the end of July, you'll have time to get side branching and set fruit because the fruit are set in the late summer, early fall. So as long as you get through by mid to late July with some of that, some of that uh, summer pruning where you tip some vigorous branches for to force branching, then you're good with that. And then you continue and do your dormant season pruning as we've already discussed. You can use any kind of mulch that you like. That was another question. Uh, pine straw is excellent. Bark works good. Uh, tree trimmings from road crew, crews that trim trees. That makes good mulch. Anything like that works. Blueberries love it really acid and mulch actually helps in that regard slowly acidify the soil. So that's a good thing. Tony, did you answer the question of um, any good local places to buy plants? And then also there's a question about blueberry fertilizer. Okay, let me tackle the fertilizer one first. Uh, the fertilizer question for blueberries is they do need a special type of fertilizer. Uh, for homeowners who just have a few plants, I tell them just to get some azalea camellia fertilizer. That's a common type of fertilizer that's sold at most garden centers, even big box stores. They may not call it blueberry fertilizer, but what it is, it's an acid forming fertilizer and, and azaleas and camellias like that as well. So if it says it's good for azaleas and camellias or gardenias, then it's also good for blueberries. So go with that and use about the same rate as it recommends for azaleas. Uh, but make sure you don't use any nitrate type fertilizer. That's the main thing is you don't want nitrate forms of nitrogen. You want ammonium based forms or urea based forms, but not nitrate form. So that's the critical thing about that. On where to get plants, um, that is a tougher question. I, I certainly would check with mom and pop nurseries first because they're more likely to have the rabbit eye types that you want. Um, but that's just gonna require you to do some research on your own. You very seldom gonna find really good variety selection at big box stores because they usually ship whatever they ship for one part of the country, they'll ship the same thing in, in a lot of other parts, just whatever they have a lot of. I'm not saying you couldn't find good varieties there, but you need to be very cautious and make sure you know what you're buying. Okay, moving along on the figs. I'll just mention that because we just had some really, really severe cold. I always tell people that if we have really severe cold weather, mother nature will do most of the pruning for you. <laughs> figs are marginally cold hardy here. So you might want to wait and see where the new growth comes out. If it's been a severe winter, sometimes you'll get sprouts coming out from the ground only and the buds won't swell up on the wood that's higher up on the plant. If it's been killed because of the cold, just cut it back to near the ground after the new growth starts to where the new growth is at. And you may have to just totally regrow the fig plant. However, uh, you may get many, many years without any cold weather and you get a plant this big. I mean, that's possible. I've seen them that big around here on occasion but usually by the time they get this large, we'll have a cold snap big enough to, bad enough to uh, knock them back down to the ground. But if they do start to get really, really big, the key is you want kind of open center. So you'll go in and cut out, remove some of the middle of the tree growth way back. They form on the new growth. So you could prune a, a fig all the way to the ground and it could make figs that year. Now, if it was a really cold winter, it may struggle to set them early enough 
that they mature before we get a freeze in the fall. But in a normal growing season, most years, even if you cut it back to a stump, you'll get fruit because they form the fruit on the new growth. Occasionally, if it's a mild winter, you'll actually get fruit forming on the old wood. Uh, and that's called a Breba fruit is the name of it. If you look it up on the internet, it's called Breba uh, fruit. Now, uh, Breba fruit will be very early. And at the same time, you'll see immature fruit on there that won't be ready until the fall. So we can actually make an early crop of fruit and a late crop in a mild winter year. Some varieties do this better than others. If it's a cold winter, then you'll probably only get the fall crop. And sometimes we even have trouble getting those to ripen before it gets really, really cold. But the main thing is cut out as much wood as you need annually to keep kind of an open center and about five main scaffolds growing out from that. That's a big one. Okay. Any questions about anything else, Rachel, on bigs or other things we've talked about so far? That's all right now, I think. Okay. All right, I'm gonna talk about some tree fruits. Well, let's talk apples first. Apples can come in um, broad types, not talking about varieties here, but the way that they make their fruit. Most of them are probably gonna be the spur type of fruit where they make little short spurs, almost like those spurs that we saw on the muscadines, short spurs and they have fruit forming on those. And those spurs can be several years old and they'll keep making fruit on those individual spurs. There are other types, a little more gangly growth habit that are called non-spur types. And they basically just means that the, they won't be little short spurs where the fruit are, they will be longer shoots. So that's the thing to investigate when you're deciding what to grow. I prefer to have varieties that are spur type because uh, they're easier to keep them smaller and maintain them. A lot of your old timey varieties that are not on dwarfing rootstocks, they may be non-spur type and they make long shoots that the fruit are on. A little harder to prune and maintain those. <clears throat> the other thing you need to think about is whether it's a dwarf or a semi-dwarf or a standard type tree. And I strongly recommend if you want a freestanding tree to go with semi-dwarf trees. Uh, if you're gonna trellis it or uh, espalier it to the side of a building or something, then you might want a dwarf type because they need some help to stand up. But I would avoid getting standard rootstock apple trees because they get too hard to prune and too hard to harvest really quickly. They can grow 30 feet tall or more. So you want something that you can maintain in a 10 to 12 foot range, which is gonna be either a dwarf or a semi-dwarf. And now let's talk just a second about training. If you do use a dwarf type, a true dwarf rootstock, you'll have to train it on a wire, much like we did the muscadines or the blackberries. It's gotta have some support or you could espalier on the side of a building or something like that. And normally you would have, as you see here, the first run of branches, maybe at two feet, four feet, six feet. And that's all you would have. And sometimes people only have two of these if it's a really dwarf variety, but three is more typical. If you use a semi-dwarf variety, up here in the upper right is what it's gonna look like. And they'll maintain at about 12 feet, to no more than 15 feet tall, but you really like to keep them in a 10 or 12 foot range so you can do most everything from the ground or a short step ladder. And then standard size trees are gonna get much, much bigger and be harder to maintain. So here's the type pruning system that we used. It's called central leader system. That just means there's one trunk, main trunk that goes straight up and then almost in a Christmas tree shape, we have side branches that come off in whorls, which is about three, three to four side branches coming out at about two feet. Then we take everything off for the next two and a half feet or so 
two to two to three feet, depending on the variety. And then we'll let more side branches come off. And then we'll repeat that a third time. And then we'll keep topping it out after that so we can keep it under 10 or 12 feet. <clears throat> so that means we're cutting off anything between these rows of branches. And we're spreading the branches. Let me back up just for a second. Uh, you may can see it in this picture. It looks like there's some little things placed in the trees that are spreading. And that's, that's we use a stiff wire, or you can actually use one by one piece of wood with a nail in each end that's been ground off to a sharp point. And you spread the branches to about 60 degrees. If you don't spread the branches, they tend to grow straight up and they're weaker. Now, eventually they'll get fruit on them and pull them down to their natural shape. But to make them stronger, we like to do that manually while we're training them to spread them out. And we can actually start that spread with a, with a um, closed pin. I think I may have a picture of that in a second. So the idea is to, to maintain it so we can get all the fruit close to the ground. So here's what it looks like uh, in the process of training it. I prefer just to have a straight whip that hasn't done any branching at all. But if it has done branching, I want the branching to be started about two feet uh, down and that's okay if it has, but if it has no branching, that's, that's fine. That's called a whip. We cut it off at about uh, 30 inches or so, and then it'll start making branches below that. And those first branches will choose about three to five spaced out around the trunk of the tree. And, um, and then we'll keep it clean for about 24 inches and do it again, and then do it again the third year. So here's what it looks like kind of, and you see here, I said you could use a clothespin to spread it out. When that little branch comes out in the spring, you can just take a clothespin and snap it to that small six inch or so branch and lean it up against the trunk of the tree and that will hold this angle right here. You can also use stiff wire. That's what's pictured here at the bottom is stiff wire. And they've actually just taken and made a hole in the limb and then into the trunk and that hole won't hurt the tree. But these you would move off after the limbs got stiff, these uh, um, these clothespins, the wire you just leave in there forever. Rachel, can you figure out where the sound is and mute for me? Okay, so this is just showing after first year, second year, third year, fourth year, fifth year. So you see these uh, dark lines here are the spreaders that we're using to keep the limbs spread out. If there's the wire, stiff wire, you can just leave them. That'll strengthen the branch. But as, as the little ones come out, you use the close pins or you use little small stiff wire as you see here. So it requires a little bit of work and you do this during the growing season while they're actively growing. Asian pears do about the same as you do for apples. I'll just mention that similar. Try to prune them as little as possible. Don't over prune an Asian pear. Just keep it clean. And this is a good illustration of what it looks like. You've got a lower tier of branches here. You've got it clean for about two and a half feet or so. Another row of branches. Again, you keep it clean. So when you cut it off after that second year's growth, these branches will develop and you'll let one keep going straight up and all the others you'll spread out. And if you get more than about three or four, remove them off completely and then keep it clean and do a third row. And then after that, you just keep cutting it off every year to keep it that same height. Same way for apples as pears and not just Asian pears, but regular pears. All right, apples that we had come up. See any? Okay, let's talk about uh, pruning peaches then. Running close on time. So Rachel, I'm gonna just give you the links and let you send them out to people on some really good videos to illustrate some of these. 
I'm getting too long winded here. Peaches we prune into what we call an open center. Rather than having a central leader like the apples, we cut out the middle of the plant and spread it out into kind of a vase or open umbrella sort of shape, upside down umbrella. And this is before it's been pruned and this is after. You really have to prune peaches pretty heavy because they're very vigorous plants. Peaches grow like a weed. So we wanna make sure that we thin them out enough every year. They make fruit on these one year old shoots that are coming off the main branches. And those shoots may be 12, 18 inches long and they may produce, if you let them produce all that they could produce, they might produce 10 or 12 fruit, but they would be tiny fruit. So we usually space them out about six inches apart when we thin the fruit, when they're about the size of the end of your thumb, make sure you thin off the extra fruit and space them so they're about six inches apart. And one of those 12 inch shoots will only have two fruit at the most. If you let them produce too many, they'll be very, very small and they'll break a lot of your limbs. So this is a before and after, just to give you an idea about how much wood that you take out we're, we're trying to reduce the height every year. So we're cutting them back so that we're keeping it at about, you know, 10 feet or so in height. And we're cleaning out the center. So we don't leave a lot of growth in there. You can leave little small shoots that might make a fruit or two, but don't leave any bigger branches or water sprouts low down in the center. You want it to be open so air and light can penetrate through that canopy really well because diseases are a big problem on, on things like peaches. Okay, I think that's all that I, all that I had. I might can show one maybe of the video. Uh, I don't think I have time to show all of them, but do we have any other questions that came up? Um, Tony, I was telling them in chat if they wanna be entered to win our door prize, the $20 gift card to Chambers, put their name and contact information in the chat box. And one question was, are nectarines the same as peaches for pruning? Yeah, nectarines are actually are a peach. They're not even a different species. They're the same species as peach. They just are fuzzless peaches, but you would do them the same way and plums, I would do the same way. Okay, I'm gonna see if I can share this to let you see the really short, I got a couple of little short videos. I can show you one on muscadines here. So. And there was, there was one more question, I'm sorry, I missed it. Um, what kind of fertilizer for apples and for peaches? For apples and peaches, you can just use a complete fertilizer like you'd use in your garden, like a 10-10-10 or 13 13 13 something along that line. Uh, they don't need a special kind of fertilizer. We highly recommend that you soil test and follow those test results. But in the absence of a soil test, just use a complete fertilizer. And you might use a little additional nitrogen, use the complete fertilizer in, in early April and then a little additional fertilizer in mid-summer about harvest time to give them a little chance for some new growth. But if they're really vigorous, you don't have to give them very much in that summer application. Okay, I have two more two more questions for you. Okay. Um, one question was about growing lemons and citrus. The second one was someone recently planted Gala and Honeycrisp apples, pears, Warren and Ayers pears, all with a standard root stock. Can I manage the size to less than 10 feet by pruning? No, you're not gonna be able to manage that pear to less than 10, you can, but that it's gonna be so vigorous, it's gonna be hard to do that. You might can keep it in the 15 foot range with really vigorous, really heavy pruning regularly. One thing that I'll mention, I kind of alluded to it early, but I didn't expound on what, it, what I meant by it is you can do some summer pruning to devigorate a plant. So you can go in in late summer before they go dormant, you know, in August, somewhere along in there, and you can prune overly vigorous plants back. Don't do all the pruning that you might do during the dormant season, but go ahead and head them back and prune them back. Some of the overly vigorous growth, any water sprout growth, any overly vigorous height growth, go ahead and remove it off then. The reason that works is because plants will send their food reserves in late summer, early fall into the main trunk and down into the root system. 
And if you'll cut it off before it has a chance to move all those nutrients while there's still leaves on the tree, it'll keep it from being able to store all that food reserve so that it doesn't become overly vigorous the next growing season. So it can really slow down and actually stunts a plant that's overly vigorous to do summer pruning, kind of late summer pruning while the leaves are still green and actively growing. Now, what was the question about citrus? I think it was just about growing it. So I move, guess- Move to Mobile or further <laughs> south. You can do that unless you're Arnold Kaler, our former experiment station director and he's growing satsumas and Meyer lemons in his yard. I doubt they survived this cold <laughs> unless he was able to tent them and put a heater out there. They can't survive temperatures in the teens. Uh, certainly in the low twenties can be harmful and the teens can be deadly. And when we get down to single digits, they're dead. You can move them indoors and out and, you know, do it that way, but no, we can't grow citrus here. Okay, I have two more questions. I'm sorry, I know you're trying to okay. show the video. Well, one was, <laughs> one was, how far back to prune if apple trees get blight? Well, you got to prune the fire blight out. They're if they're susceptible to fire blight, you can't leave the fire blight in the tree. It 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 won't get better. It'll just keep going down until it gets in the main trunk and kill the plant. So when you see fire blight burning back branches, go ahead and remove about 12 inches past the point where they're dead to live growth and then sterilize your pruning clippers with some rubbing alcohol between every single cut and then remove that fire blight out of the orchard. Don't leave it laying under the tree. And you can spray for fire blight with a streptomycin, same thing we use in human medicine, but it's an agricultural grade of streptomycin uh, or a copper-based compound you can use. And you spray during the bloom time to prevent it because bees spread it from flower to flower as they pollinate. So you got to spray it while they're in bloom. But then if you don't get it all, you got to remove it out as soon as you see it to at least 12 inches past the dead portion. And another question, one was on um, pruning back an overgrown peach tree. And then we had a similar question about pear tree moving into an established um, yard that had a pear tree that produces pears, but they're bad. And it looked like it had never been pruned before. Yeah, on the overgrown peach tree, I would cut it down and plant another one. Uh, literally, they're, they're not worth saving when they get severely overgrown because that means they're old. Peach trees here are not product, not real productive past about year 12 to 15. If they're older than that, they lose most of their productivity because of diseases and insects, pests that get in the trunk of the tree and the root system. So I would just replant. They grow really fast and you can have you a new one quicker and you could get that one back into production. Old overgrown pear trees just cut, you know, a, maybe half of the growth off of that one year like one side of the plant and the next year do the other side of the plant, but do it in the late summer rather than in the winter because that slows down the growth of the plant, keeps it from re-sprouting so bad. Still gonna have some re-sprouting, but not as bad. It's really not an easy thing to do. You can get online and Google and YouTube, you know, trying to salvage an old pear tree and you'll find some videos showing you what I'm talking about, uh, but uh, they're, they're tough, tough to restore. Rachel, what I'll do is I'll send you some of these that I thought were pretty good short videos, and then uh, you can you can send it out on your Facebook. Yes, page. I'll so, put it so on our Facebook page. Because we're bumping up against one o'clock, and I've got another Zoom I've got to get on. So, Well, thank you so much, Tony, for doing this today. Um, we, will, we will put the recording on our Facebook page, and then eventually we'll get it on our YouTube channel. Um, thanks for those who gave us your contact. I'll do a drawing and then I'll contact you if you won the gift card to Chambers. Um, thanks for all your resources. And next month we will be back with Tony with pruning ornamentals. And that one will be similar to this one. It'll be on Zoom and we'll do Facebook Live. And that one's going to be March the 17th at noon. So same day, same time, same place. So thank you so much for coming.
We appreciate it. And look on our Facebook page. I will put the videos that Tony uh, posted for us. So y'all have a good day and um, check out our website at www.agriplex.org. We have our programs open for registration. I'm going to leave it open just a minute longer in the chat. If you want to win that gift card, give me your name and your contact information in the chat box, please. We had over 50 people today, so we had a really good program. Thank you.